Hello there, I'm Steve Matchett, mostly retired. Join me, won't you? I think without question, the 246 Dino, and this is a 74 example, right, is one of the most interesting cars to ever leave the stables of Marinello. And that phrase alone is kind of loaded with intrigue because leaving the stables of Marinello, the car was never badged as a Ferrari. It was really badged under the emblem of Fiat. My understanding is there are no Ferrari badging on most Dinos. I'm gonna say most Dinos because there's a little story about the badge on the back of this one. And the only place that you should see Ferrari dancing horse, the prancing horse emblem on a Dino is inside the door jam on the plate down here. Not, you won't find it on the front, on the hood, on the bonnet. You won't find it on the steering wheel or on the, uh, the wheel caps. And for those who don't, uh, are unaware of my history with Ferrari, I used to work with Great Paul Motors in England back in the 1980s, who were renowned for their restoration projects. And one of the problems that Ferrari had in selling the Dino, you've hit the nail right on the head there, is, well, where's the Ferrari emblem? How do we know what we're buying? And so for many years, this car was overlooked as, something else and the prices in England and the rest of the world up until fairly recently were quite affordable yeah I mean I had an opportunity to buy I was a young mechanic in England with hardly any funds but I was offered the chance to buy a couple for a few thousand pounds and I couldn't rustle up the money to do it well I really wish I had it and I really wish I'd had them to this day yes. I mean in my time in restoration there was this there's this golden rule that you, you, the last thing you want to do is over restore something. You're trying to bring something back to the day that it left the facility, the factory in this case, in Maranello in headquarters in, in Northern Italy. But if you don't need to touch something, don't touch it because you're bound to affect the originality. We see a lot of restored Dinos, of course we do. And they're, they are beautiful looking examples, yeah. like they were made yesterday. It's There's not nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But when you see an original car, that has great extra value because it's original. It hasn't been touched. Yeah, the, the, the beauty of this example, like we said, is the fact that it's completely untouched in all the aspects. And absolutely, and talking about driven and the driven lines around the car, when you look what Pininfarina did to the design of the 246 Dino, or the Dino project in its entirety, the 206 as you mentioned earlier on, this has just the most exquisite, wonderful flowing lines over the car. It does. It's one of the most beautiful things that Pininfarina, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful things Pininfarina ever designed. In many ways, uh, it's, a, it's an analog machine. The feedback from the road goes straight to the driver's hands it, it, on the steering wheel, you're absolutely right. But back in the 1970s, <clears throat> this is the artist, the aerodynamicists at work thinking, how do we control the airflow? So it's, the, it's an artist's interpretation right. of what is the best airflow around the car. That, that is something very special to me. That's what makes it a work of art. And first off, Marcel, the first thing that springs to mind to me from my years as working as a mechanic, whether on Ferrari or in Formula One, is a golden rule of, of, of chassis design and weight distribution on the car is get the engine as far forward as possible. Well, that makes it more of a balanced vehicle. Makes yeah. it a balanced vehicle, improves the handling of the car, makes it a more nimble steering car, more positive steering on the car. So not only did Ferrari not have the engine back here, which would have made it a lot easier to work on, shift it as far forward as possible, but also make sure that it's a transverse design. So the, the great mass of the engine is moved to the theoretical perfect center point of the car. So now uh, air compressor for the for the very distinctive horn is that's what that is right absolutely the air horn there. yeah yeah that's what gives that very distinctive horn and but you mentioned it earlier on Marcel when you look underneath what well, Adino in this case this will tell you how well the car has been driven uh, the upper bodywork will show you how well it's been maintained and polished and taken care of but the underside will give all the uh, indications of, of road marks on it. And how it's been serviced ah, as well. Absolutely, yes, it will, yes. So you can see, you, you mentioned the fiberglass earlier on, and it is, it is fiberglass, it's pre-carbon fiber, right. of course. But you can see all that, you can see the chop fibers uh, very clearly in the panel. So that is original, that is correct. You should expect to see some fluid marks around the car, you're always gonna get that. I mean, the car has certainly been driven, it's been used. Um, the radiator is mounted at the top, above yeah, us here. Right here, yeah. 
Yeah, and here is one of the hoses we were mentioning earlier on. We're going to start to run back through the chassis. So right down the center section of the car, and we can show that when we get towards the back as well, that's where the two rubber hoses disappear. So there's no way of being able to inspect the condition of those pipes without removing them, which is a right. massive drama. But there is no inspection holes around that tube to see what's happening on the inside there. Steve, can we see, like I see here, the radiator has the upper hose yeah. and, the, and our lower hose, yeah. those radiator hoses, which do go all the way to the back. Yeah. Those look real good and I love the bracketry on it or the hardware, so be it. It looks like it's been done at some point. They're not leaking, so that's really good. It's, it is It is really good and antifreeze um, over the years is very telling. You, you'll start, you'll see it, right? It's, it gives a witness mark. Right. As soon as you get one little leak with antifreeze, it's very good in that regard that it will leave a witness mark of where it's leaking from. Yeah. And you would expect to see some marks and damage around the car. One of the things you would expect to see on a genuine Dino that's being honest is if you've broken down at the side of the road at midnight and you've got your tuxedo on and you need to change a spare tire, you're not getting on the ground to find out where to jack these cars up. And so it's, it's very obvious where people have put the jacks in the wrong place and lifted the car, tried to raise it, and it will start to bend the floor because you put it in the wrong place. Really, you want to be on the lower, lower suspension arms for security, or there is one of the chassis tubes runs back here at 45 degrees and you can get under here. I but see you, that, that's you, a good strength point yeah, right there. Yeah, but, but look at this, uh, this is, oh, this is classic indication here. that somebody, I would suggest somebody's put a jack under there. Okay. There's more witness marks over on the other side as well where but it's, again, it's all honest indications of the car's history. I love seeing that the under tray, which again, made out of steel, is all fully intact. And even the, per the parts that are exposed to the elements, like this area here, yeah. you see it hasn't gone through all the way. It's just surface rust. The tubular chassis is what really is important for me. You mentioned on the front that we have the tubular frame here. Yeah. You can see it has gotten some road pitting on it, but that's as perfect as it could be. Yeah. It goes and follows all the way through. The fender arches, they're made out of glass fiber as well, right? Because I see the hairs pointing yes, they, out of the yeah, side. Yeah, they should be, yeah. W one interesting point I'm gonna point out to you, Marcel, about the design of the chassis. In this period of Maranello's history, it's not square tubing and it isn't round tubing, it's oval tubing. Yeah, it looks like, it, it, like this. Yeah, they, they, make, they make it oval because that gives the most torsional rigidity when you're loading it up and down on that axis, Very cool. it, it makes it the, it's the strongest thing you can do with that tube is to make it not round, not square, but to make it oval. So that's what that's what Ferrari did. So all the main chassis tubes around Dino are, are designed that way to give that maximum rigidity. At uh, one point, again, we should mention when we're at the front of the car, the suspension on a Dino is adjustable, the camber and caster. Uh, on, on the Dino is adjustable with shims behind the front suspension pickups. Oh, so I see. two for the lower arm on, the, on one side, two for the suspension arm on the other. And when you just, I mean, just as a quick visual inspection, when you look at the car, you want to see, if the car is tracking honestly, you want to see a similar number of shims side to side. Uh, and this has got what, maybe one. one one, shim each side, so maybe a millimetre shim yeah. uh, front and rear, which is very good. What you don't want to see is a stack of, say, 15 mil shims on one side, and somebody's had to take the angle grinder on the other side to push it together, which is sure uh, indicative that the, sh the frame's been twisted. Got it. So when you see a car like this, and it looks like they haven't been touched for years, quite frankly, but that's perfectly okay. What you're looking for is symmetry side to side. It's a, just a good visual clue the, the frame is straight. straight. Yes, it's yeah. very important. Yeah. Here is the overlated section of the chassis, the tube that runs straight down here. So you can see the two cool upper pipe, and lower upper, radiator uh, hoses that go all the way right here. But you see, from here until down there, you, you can't see them. Right. They're lost. Right. So you just have to, you know, cross your fingers and hope everything's okay. And earlier on, I mentioned that these pipes tended to just rot out and rust out over a period of time. Look how nice they yeah. look like, because they've been obviously redone. And they would rot right here. Where the water sits in the bottom here, they'd start to rot out here and here. So they're the two pipes, and boy, oh boy, we had such a drama trying to get hold of these from Marinello back in the day, because we just, we couldn't get them. Yeah, so we were trying to make our own, we were trying to weld them up and that sort of thing. Now, of course, you don't need to do that. I'm sure you can get them relatively easy. Relatively easy. Jacking points on the rear, Marcel. Much easier to see than the oh, front. Oh yes, we can see this super section. beefy right here. Yeah, left, left and right, we've got these triangulated sections, which is cool. It's a really strong part of the car. Um, fuel tanks 
uh, left and right. So, so both right, of right, these right. are fuel tanks, right? Both of these are fuel tanks, yeah. And, and they have a balance pipe. Uh, you can see right oh, here. Oh, right there. There's okay. a balance pipe. And here's a drain bung. So you can drain the fuel. Um, so effectively, the two tanks balance each other out. You don't have to use an electric pump to change from starboard uh, to port oh. uh, tanks. They'll just balance through that one pipe. Um, and they they fit here. But they are quite a nightmare. If you do have to get these fuel tanks out, they're a bit of a nightmare. And you mentioned earlier on the inner, inner fender. For accessibility for yeah, service. That, yeah, that all that's come out. Yeah. And one of the biggest problems we used to encounter uh, back in the 80s was all the bolts. No one thought to put any copper ease or lubricant on those bolts. And you just break every single one off. You couldn't, they you rust know, and they seize, just, right? yeah, they were so fragile that they would break off. And of course that would turn a 10 minute job into a three hour job because you have to re-drill and re-tap and oh, repair all that. Yeah. So it's a bit of a, so you didn't really want to get involved with taking a fuel tank out, but that's how you did it. Here it is. And Steve, I'm looking at these straps. They're made out of steel. They yeah. look like they're in excellent shape Yeah, too. they do. Uh, that, they that's very, do. and it's a very cool, this is, this is, this is a little sign in, to my eye of Marinello having a history in racing because you don't just have the tank strap sitting around the tank and connected here. You want some sort of support as it comes so around. They squish the as tank. it comes around the radius of the tank there, and that's and that's what Ferrari did was to put this little bracket on here so that the strap would sit in it and you wouldn't get any lateral movement on it. Yeah, yeah. So very cool. Here's that more of that. You can see it very clearly here. Yeah, that here that overlaid overlaid pipe uh, tube chassis frame on the back, and. Uh, the shims left and right. Again, if you look at the stack of shims, there are more shims on the rear than on the front. Right. That isn't the issue. Once again, you're looking for a symmetrical set. So let's gauge that to be eight millimeters worth of, of uh, shimming in there. I'd say that eight right? to 10 is And right. if we look on the opposite side, pretty much the same. A little bit less on one side, but right. that's usually, you're gonna get a little bit of variation. The front is exactly the same. So I would say that's more that, that, again, that's indicative that the frame is straight. Someone's just been playing around to set the geometry on the car, but there's nothing, there's nothing, it's, it's clearly there's nothing off. Again, you haven't got 15 mil on one side and zero on the other side. Right, right. No, so you would expect to see a little variation, but all in all, front to rear, I'd say that's, that's, that's a good indication to me that the frame is, is where it should be. We have engine mounts here, which is, I guess, well, this is actually the transaxle. So yeah, so this is the transaxle. Yeah, the diff mounted in up here, and it's very clean down here. I know. You can, well, clearly someone's resealed yeah. all this yeah. stuff because there's not a drop of oil, and they usually collect some. I like to see this when anyone has drained the oil out that they mark it with a paint pen just so you can see any movements on the plug. Uh, this is just a nice thing. It shows that somebody's been doing it correctly. You know, I like to see that. I like seeing also, because then the technician knows if whoever's worked on behind them, yeah. that someone's done something differently. Yeah. So this is the... Um, transmission. Uh, this is a transmission drain here, and this is the motor transmission. Right. Here. So, so you can, you means... Uh, be your box. Yeah, so I'm not very good Both on the it, but those little okay. words that you see every day, you know, when you're working on Ferrari, you pick it up. Yeah, so gearbox and, and, and engine. And then we see that the axle boots look very nice as well. All the rubbers for it are great. Yeah. There's no grease slinging uh, uh, or anything. And they are the correct nuts to have on the back. They're like a castellated nut in a way, but it's the, uh, the top section of the nut has a crimping effect, which will, which will um, grip onto the bolt to keep it in place. Uh, and you should also see as well, Marcel, behind the head of the uh, cap head bolts, which go through, they have a little shim. Uh, you'll notice it between two oh, yes. and then okay. there'll be two at the top. So there, there isn't, the, this is absolutely correct. There is no shim between these two. Uh, because they, they're closer together. But these two and two further around, you'll find that there are those shims underneath, which again, they should be there. It shows to me that whoever has worked on the car in the past has done it correctly, put them back correctly. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the factory see. exhaust system meets all the way up to the actual cat back, which goes to then to the Stubi style stainless steel exhaust. Uh, it's an Italian aftermarket exhaust, but yeah. all this here in fact, uh, for the exhaust manifolds, look to be original, which is yes. great. One of the weaknesses of the Dino design, and we mentioned it earlier on when we were outside looking at the car, is where the, well, I'm gonna call it the front bank of the engine is mounted up against the firewall. The, the header, the exhaust head is, is a nightmare to get to. Can you imagine? Uh, so yeah. if you have to replace it, you have to replace it, but that's one, you, I mean, it's very difficult to see, even from down here looking up, you can kind of see where it goes, but it's, it's very well hidden between the rear firewall and the head of the engine. Uh, and that is a potential weakness. So 
If you ever hear a slight exhaust blow on a Dino and you can't find it because the rear box and everything looks like, go for that. Go for that. Because nobody's bothered to replace it because it's a drama to get to. The handbrake works off the caliper, so it is disc brakes all the way around. It's a very basic system for the handbrake to work. It's just got the cable here hooked over a lever and the lever pushes one of the pistons out. You know, just a bit. Awesome. You, you, you know, my advice to anybody that owns a 246, do you know, do not park it on a hill relying entirely on the handbrake. Go to the gear. Put it in gear and leave yeah. it in gear. It's a weakness of the design, but it's not just the Dino. A, a lot of Everything baguette, in this thing, I like, yeah, the 70s really, is like this, yeah, so. Yeah. But I love what I'm seeing here. I can see the valve cover, at least on the rear bank of the engine. It looks super dry. I mean, I can see it's been resealed, but it's done well. Yes. And even if you look at the top of myself, the, the, the hoses and the clamps, you, were, you mentioned them earlier on, um, they look aged, but they look correct. Right? Yeah, they look like aged. they've been replaced. Yeah, but they look, they look correct. And I'll tell you the first place where you'll start to notice it is it forms on the on the stud. Yeah, exactly right. I've seen them where yeah. they get like a little drip. They get, a, the... they get a little bead of oil form on the stud, so you can go straight to it and see it. Yeah, very cool to see all that. And I, I know a lot of people talk about the synchros when they're cold. Yeah, very hard to shift. But if you let the gearbox warm up, they go in the smooth as butter. That's exactly right. And we have modern uh, fluids nowadays that have you know definitely made the driving experience a little bit better. Yeah. So I know all these have been changed out. We've got service records of all that being done. Here, when we're trying to point out the weaknesses, and I'm not saying this is a weakness, but we can see here this little gate as, as, as it started to break open, but it, it, it's because of oil contamination. Is that the shift shaft seal? Yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a gate. So there's no oh, word or anything in there. I know what you mean. You know, it, yes. it's a protector. Right. But it, they, they start to rot, they do. It's just, but what happens is over the years, oil gets on that and, and it just starts to break Swell down. Swell and break yeah, down. Yeah, but yep. we, if you, if we're here to highlight the weaknesses of the car as much as the strength of the car to give a full, honest appraisal, yeah. just look for this sort of thing. But that's, it's nothing major. Be aware that it's there. Yeah, you can see. To my not, to the best of my knowledge, this was an alley panel. I don't think it's still. I think it was alley, and nothing wants to stick to it. Like it's, it's just, you know what I mean. You can see it just doesn't want to key into the surface. But also, when you see these marks, you can see just how how supple. Uh, yeah, that, that you, you would expect metal. to see that. Like, there's no, there's no great structural rigidity into this pack. It's really more for aero flow, frankly. Got it. But when you see things like this, don't get overly concerned that, oh my goodness, what on earth is that near? This could have been done just by a curbstone or something. Something very minimal yeah. will cause that amount of damage. There's no, again, there's no real strength in this. It's just, it, it exists. Flows, right? It exists, and that's it, really, yeah. Thank you for looking at this with me, Steve. I yeah. think some transparency that you know, we need to have showcased and it's nice to have eyes from someone that has had their hands and eyes on it when it was brand new at the well, work. I appreciate very much you asking me to come down and have a look at it with you. It's a fun trip down memory lane for me to be underneath a 246 Dino.